Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that we have a ton of extra content over on our Patreon. We do movie watch parties, special Patreon bonus episodes, and all other sorts of wacky stuff that you can access easily if you head on over to patreon.com slash film whiskey. Hey everybody, Bob here, and I just want to tell you really quickly about Anchor.fm. We are using Anchor to host our podcast. That's where we basically build out the podcast. It's where we schedule episodes. If you have been looking into getting into podcasting, I cannot recommend Anchor.fm highly enough. We were using another one in the past that actually cost us money each month. Anchor.fm is free. You can actually build your whole podcast inside of Anchor. You can record directly to the website. You can have people Record and leave messages for you there. You can even set up a wallet to start accepting donations from your listeners. Anchor.fm has everything you need to start your own podcast. So the real question is, what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. On today's Film and Whiskey, we are hanging out with the one and only Andre Houston Mack. You might know him from his YouTube videos with Bon Appetit, which have amassed hundreds of millions of views. Or maybe you've dined in one of his many restaurants. We're going to talk with Andre about his history as a sommelier, as well as his favorite movie. That's all ahead on Film and Whiskey. Hey, everybody. Welcome into the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we're coming at you with another special bonus episode. Mm, Bonus episode. Brad, you know, I don't often pat us on the back, but I got to say, these bonus episodes, man, we've been, uh, we've kind of been killing it, you know? Stellar. (laughs) They've been really, really good. We've had some incredible interviews this season, and I think we are capping off season six with maybe... My most anticipated guest ever. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if we are doing a great job interviewing, but I know that our guests have been killing it lately. (laughs) And I do not have any doubt that that is going to change tonight, Bob. Yeah, no pressure. He's hanging out in the background here, but uh, (laughs) no pressure at all. Today, we are joined by one of my very favorite people to go down the YouTube rabbit hole with, and that is sommelier and entrepreneur Andre Houston Mack. Andre, how are you today? Yay, yay. I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm excited. Got some whiskey, you know, going to chat it up with you guys and uh, talk about movies, man. Man, I like the the timing of this is the most fortuitous thing I've ever experienced in my life because, you know, I've been watching your videos. Bon Appetit has these, this incredible series of videos with you uh, that have seen tremendous success. And the whole season of our show, I've been like, man, I really want to get this guy on the show. He he gets what we're about when we review whiskeys. We, we judge on five categories and it's, you know, like your standard tasting categories. And then we throw in a fifth okay. category, which is value. Like, is it worth okay. the money? And I'm like, I'm watching you put dollar bills down next to a bottle of wine and, and measure mm-hmm. out how much it costs. And I'm like, this guy gets it. Yeah. I, I literally said to Bob <laughs> right before we got on, I was like, when I'm watching his video and I see a 20, a five and three ones next to a bottle of wine, I'm like, I know what it feels like to, you know, slap that on the counter to buy a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of wine. Like, yeah, you just have such an approachable way of of dealing with something that can be, you know, kind of snooty and pretentious. And uh, it's that's man, you have friends in us, Andre. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, I don't know. It's so it's funny. It just kind of comes natural in a way of like, you know, wine already from the outside looking in is is pretty pretentious. You know, and and I was at one time on the outside looking in and, uh, you know, it didn't feel really good. But like once you got over that hump, you realize that, you know, everybody was pretty nice. Right. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a few there's a few uh, that, you know, a few bad apples. But like other than that, I, you know, wine to me was like just felt like something that everybody should have. And, you know, I I spent some time grew up in Europe. I wouldn't say grew up there. You know, I lived like three or four years there as a child. But wine was something that we always saw on the table. It was, you know what I mean? It was never uh, uh, a centerpiece. Like, you know what I mean? It wasn't like, like 
you know, the, the bottles were sitting in the center of the table and everybody was worshiping, worshiping them. You know, it just wasn't a meal without, without wine. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was something that stuck with me. It just, it just felt part of the, the European like diet. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I say that, that the timing was fortuitous because I reached out to your people and I was like, Hey, I'd love to have Andre on the show. And they're like, yeah, actually, he has a new whiskey that he'd like to talk about, too. <laughs> what, what are the freaking odds, man? This is incredible. And we yeah, no, it's been great. <laughs> we, we got sent a bottle of your Rye and Sons, which, uh, you know, spoiler alert, we will get into tasting here in a little bit. But it's phenomenal stuff, man. No, and again, you. at the price point, like, yeah, Brad, if we're scoring this out on the value category, this is a 10 out of 10 value. Yeah, easily. I mean. The level of quality you're getting with a, a two year rye for twenty eight dollars, I like you said, Bob. We'll get into the tasting notes later, but this is a daggone good whiskey, my friend. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's I, you guys hit on the point exactly. Like for me, it was to over deliver, mm. right? To like to like like rarely do we do we pay for something and and and. And feel guilty that about what what price we paid for it, right? It's generally the other way around. And I think what's really great about Ryan Sons is like we made the best possible whiskey that we could um, at the best possible price. And I feel like the value is there. It's something that you can taste. It's undeniable. Um, and I, you know, that's. I mean, I think that was what I really wanted to contribute to, like starting this Ferris brand. Yeah, right. It's very similar what we've what I've built in the in the wine industry is you know building you know undervalued price wines that I think that over deliver uh, and that are delicious. Well, yeah, Andre, let's talk a little bit about that history. You know, I was just watching a, a video of you today to prepare when you were giving a TED talk and you talked about how your first job was at McDonald's. And, <laughs> yeah. and once again, I was like, this is my people right here. Like, <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about the journey from McDonald's to internationally renowned sommelier. Uh, it's, it's pretty funny and remarkable to kind of look back on, you know, I'm not a big reflections guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, um, my first job was McDonald's. I was 16. I needed, I, I needed a job. I lived, uh, right. It was right around the corner from my house by SeaWorld I was living in Texas. And yeah, it was, just, it was, it was an interesting thing because I actually wanted to work the cash register and they were like, Oh no, it was kind of like a weird, felt like a weird sexist thing where it's like only the girls who work <laughs> the cast register and I had to like rack fries or some shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, uh, and you know, and I think that's kind of all what I kind of knew was just like, was food and beverage. Right. You know, so I worked there. I, you know, I worked at a place called Jack in a box, right. Yep. Yep. Home of the ultimate cheeseburger. Yep. Uh, you know, it felt like those jobs were easy as I was like, you know, getting ready, you know, like in high school at tell in like not a big of a commitment. Um, and then I started working at Red Lobster, which is, you know, which is, you know, I think they actually had wines on the wine list there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think they had three wines. They were all they were all white Zinfandel. Right. So it was, it was a pretty it was pretty it was pretty interesting, you know. Um, and, you know, and I worked I worked at Red Lobster for quite some time. I would probably say about, you know, about eight years on and off. You know, I moved to Oklahoma for college. You know, I didn't. It was interesting because, like, I wasn't I I. I guess what I learned from those places, I would say they weren't really great food places in, in the sense of where I ended up. But, you know, it taught me that, like, I really like the interaction with people. I think that's what my biggest takeaway when I went on to my bigger and better thing. And, you know, I ended up working for Citicorp Investment Services. The idea of walking up to a group, a table of strangers and getting to know them over the next 60 minutes and getting things from them. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there was something about that um, that I enjoyed. You know, and I think when I went on to finance, you know, that's kind of what I missed. And I think what kind of like pulled me back to, to coming back into restaurants. But um, I think for, I think for me, um, I was working in those kind of jobs and then went on to my, you know, to work in Citicorp Investment Services. But, you know, I started to watch old episodes of Frasier and the way that they talked about wine, I think was really inspiring to me. I had never... Wine was never a big deal for me. I think mo mostly at this point, I probably drank beer and, you know, a lot of like, you know, blended whiskey, mm. you know, from you know, like Johnny Walker Plot or yeah, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't, it didn't, you know, so like that kind of drinking didn't have this camaraderie around it that it seemed like wine did. And and it, although Frazier and his brother, you know, they were these pompous kind of almost characters of themselves. Uh, and very snooty. There was something very funny about it, and how they made fun of themselves. That um, 
that show really gave me the courage to walk into a wine store for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, you know, I always felt like um, the greatest foil to pretension uh, is through humor. And, you know, somehow by watching that show, I could arm myself with some type of comedic antidote that would like somehow protect me. I know it sounds dumb, but that's what it took to, for me to get into a wine store. And I think the rest is kind of history. And that sense of like, I realized that they were open and that we just, we, I went in almost every single, like two or three times a week and talked and, and really, you know, what we like to call in the wine industry, you know, caught the wine bug. Hmm. Uh, and I think that was it for me. And then I went back to restaurants. I heard of this thing called a sommelier, which I had never heard of. I remember my mom was like, so what, what you do, baby? What's it called? <laughs> I, said, I, said, I, said, I said, it's called, it's called a sommelier, mom. She's like, so what you doing? I said, like, you just, you like, you're bringing wine to the table? Like, really? You get paid to do that? You know, it yeah. was like, so it was something like that. And, uh, and that was it, you know, and I think, you know, I moved kind of fast. I think after, you know, within 18 months of really getting into wine, you know, I was, you know, I was a sommelier at the French Laundry. Wow. You know, at the time was considered the best restaurant in the world. So I talked a little bit about uh, this TED talk of yours that I was watching earlier today. And you talked a little bit about your first line of wines called uh, Mouton Noir, which translates to black sheep and how you embraced that role or that title of black sheep. Yeah. And, you know, we, we were talking right before we pressed record about, you know, if I can call it your brand, like you're just, you're yeah. just a super approachable guy. And I think <laughs> that's, that's the hook is that no one feels condescended to when they're talking to or learning from you. And I guess my question then is like, do you think that your ability to keep things approachable, even at such a high level that you're at now, can that be traced back to you being kind of a, a wine outsider or a black sheep? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I think not growing up with it uh, and, and also like really understanding where I come from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, um, I just recently found out I turned 50, you know, that I was in foster care. You know, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. earlier this year, wow. like, you know what I mean? Like, so I don't, you know, I never came from a place, a lofty place of wine, but it was something that, you know, something that I, I respected and understood, but also I think I understand talking to people and, and there's a certain way to talk to people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Sure. I think, you know, yeah, yeah. And everybody thinks that it's supposed to have like an ascot on or something like that, but like, that's not it. I'm a, you know, you can be a regular guy and, and, and appreciate wine, uh, and I think I've always challenged the status quo in that by just showing it up. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so easy to be intimidated by what you perceive about people. And yet when you sit down, if you're able to find something that you like that they also like, uh -huh. man, it doesn't matter how much money they make versus what you make, what city they're from versus where you're from. Like, man, if you guys both like wine and can, com you know, compare notes and enjoy your time together drinking wine, then all of a sudden you're on an equal playing field. A and it feels like you are just out there leveling the playing field of, you know, the world of wine for so many people. Yeah, it's been pretty remarkable. Um, you know, just the feedback, you know, we've gotten of like people, you know, people, somebody just traveled from Hungary to come <laughs> to the restaurant to bring me a bottle of wine and to, you know, maybe catch a glimpse if I was in the restaurant, Wow, you know, like, so it's, it's definitely resonating with people and connecting with people, you know, people who aren't really into wine. Right. I think someone was like, I don't even drink, but they, you know, they, they consume the content. Uh, you know, I think I, I, I'm, it, it, it feels good. I think I'm pretty fortunate in that way uh, that, you know, people are, re are responding to it. Um, but I must say there's no trick or anything like that. It's just, it's just really just me. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, and I think just like being, you know, we, I talk a lot about like, you know, when we say Mouton Noir and the Black Sheep, I think me also just like, you know, I think what's most relatable in naming my company that was that we've all felt out of place. Hmm. We all felt like outcasts, misfits at some point in our life. And I think that's a feeling that we all know. And I think for me it was like, why don't I just embrace what makes me different? Yeah, Andre, yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre, you're gonna get me preaching here in a second, man. Uh, like, uh, come on, man, let's go. You know, I mean, and that, I think, like to me, that's that's really true. I guess, like, and in, in, in that TED talk, what I thought was most interesting is, is as I was standing there, because you, the people in the crowd see me, they, the ob most obvious thing is that I look different than most of them. Mm. But that's not really what I was talking about either. I mean, that's the obvious part, right? That, you know, is, is that I look different than most people that are in the wine or that were in that 
in that room. But what embracing embracing what makes you different was not also just embracing who I am, but also like I just don't do things the way everybody else does them, mm-hmm. right? And and also taking on that moniker allowed me to do to do things that were unconventional. Like you can't name your company the Black Sheep and like be straight place. Like you got to do some interesting stuff. And yeah, like and, and I think it, it's really kind of helped me, you know, just like kind of lean in and say, well, you know, there is no blueprint to this. You know, I don't have a great 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 grandfather you know, quote unquote, who would be rolling over in the, in his grave <laughs> if, you know, if because I decided to like, you know, to like wear this t-shirt somewhere. Yeah. Well, right. and s- speaking of like, you know, doing things your own way, uh, how did the YouTube opportunities come about? Like, I, I don't feel like wine sommeliers are often, you know, on YouTube, just, you know, given their, their thoughts on stuff. So did you, did you know that it was going to be a hit when you started it? Did you expect <laughs> this kind of reception? Um, I, no, I didn't. I, um, I, the opportunity I came, um, you know, they reached out and, and said, Hey, would you like to, you know, maybe shoot a video or two? And I think for me, you know, I've done a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, at, the, at this point, you know, I think I had a commercial with Microsoft. I had a commercial with like, uh, uh, Cadillac, you know, so I had dabbled and done, you know, some stuff in front of the camera. Um, but this was a little different. And, you know, I think I was more worried about, like what kind of content it was right mm. you know it's like for me i think we live in a world where you know everything is savage and it's about the takedown yeah and my thing is it's like i only want to talk about stuff that's worth talking about yeah and um and so i think upon upon that they agreed and we you know they said i signed like a a three pilot deal and i think after we aired the first one um they offered me a full contract yeah yeah, I mean it's it's incredible stuff, man. And I think that you really obviously if you if you went into it with this intention, it's succeeding because one of the things I love about them is that you're not savaging the wines that you don't like. Like you're finding Mm-mm. things in the wine that you do like or you're picking out notes and saying like, "Oh, maybe if this developed a little bit more, it would be really robust." And I just I like that there is a way to say, "Hey, this is not for me" without saying mm-hmm. this isn't for anyone. Yeah, trash. Like you know, like yeah. everybody's quick to say, "Oh, this is trash." But like you know what? Like there has to be some type of decorum. You know, like you know, for most of my training as a sommelier, when you taste wines, there's there's sales reps that are standing in front of you, mm. right? And and sometimes the owner or the winemaker of the wine is standing in front of you. Uh, and so you know, there's a there's a you know, I was always taught talk about the wine, right? Like. It's all it goes back to the wine. Well, you know what? This has a little bit too much, too much choke. And oak con Sauvignon Blanc doesn't really work with the chef's food. Hmm. Right? You know what I mean? Like, so it's yeah. like there's ways of being able to do that. And I think I just kind of carried that over. You know, um, it's always, you know, what's interesting to me is like you film them and, they're, and you're in an empty room. Yeah. Right? You, you know what I mean? So it's <laughs> like, mm-hmm. so, and it's like the camera guy, you know, like you're trying to crack some jokes and like nobody's laughing and shit. Right. So you're like, 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 all right, guys, I'll be here all week. Right. You know, make sure you tip your waitress. And, then, <laughs> and so it's like, oh, and then and so then now the video comes out and then like it's still kind of empty in a way. Right. Because all you see, all I see is the views. Mm. Right. And then so it's still not real. Right. Yeah. But I think for me that where the real connection is, is being out in the wild and people running into people who watch it right? Who's actually consume it, right? Because those numbers aren't real to me that you see on views, because I'm thinking to myself, who the hell is watching this? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, you know, and there it is, you know, you had a, you know, I was at a bar, I walked, I mean, he was grabbing pizza, he was a patron, walked past me and then came back and was like, hey, you know, he works at a, a, a one star Michelin restaurant in Brooklyn. And he he's like, I like your videos have taught me so much. He works there. Wow. And he's like, the industry people are watching it, uh, which I, you know, which are interesting. Like, uh, like that makes me feel good. Like, is you know what I mean? Like, and I try, and that was like, I, so that's why I try to keep it professional and and that way because, like, you know, not only are like novice like looking at this uh, content, but it is also being consumed by people who are in the industry, uh, uh, and that feels good to me. Yeah. You know, that like that's the payoff I think for me is is like you know it's touching world world people in the world. Oh. 
Well, I think it's a great segue to start talking about this whiskey because, you know, you, you've got yeah. your hands in things outside of the wine industry now. And I guess, you know, my first question about the whiskey brand is like, why now? And 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 why whiskey? You know, you, you could have very easily yeah. launched another line of wines if you'd like to. But what is it about whiskey aside from just, hey, the market's exploding that attracted you to this? Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and just to be honest, like I felt like I felt like it was over, right? Mm, I was like, yeah. I was like the market. I was like, isn't it? It seems pretty saturated. Sure. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so I was like, oh, maybe I missed that boat. Like, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like I pine. I was I was gonna pine over it. It's just like how the opportunity came. But like I said before, like I generally drank whiskey. That was kind of that's what I did before I was in, even in wine. So like being in college, you know, I, uh, one of the waiters at Red Lobster was the bookie. Or had a had a bookie mm -hmm. was really tight with a bookie, and so uh, he got me gambling, and so uh, you know we you know I think like forty something college games, you know for college football on Saturday, <laughs> almost every single NFL game. Um, oh, and hard guys, make sure you flash like a one eight hundred number up here for people who have a gambling problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make sure, make sure we, cover, we cover our bases here. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a, little a little HR. <laughs> if you or a loved one has a gambling problem, <laughs> yeah. and. Um, and so it was an interesting guy. And like, I think Mondays were paydays, right? So like on Monday night, he would take us out. And when we would go to a bar, he would walk in and, you know, he said, uh, you know, something like, let me get a, a Weller's Wood Rock or something like that. This is not like in 1996, 95. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm like, Weller's like, what kind of shit? What is that? You know, you right. know what I mean? Like the, and the bar, to, <laughs> the bar, to respond, the bar's like, we don't have it. And he's like, all right, we're getting the f out of here. So then we would leave <laughs> and then we would go somewhere else <laughs> where they have Weller's. And it was just like... And I was thinking, like, what old shit is this? Like, what is he talking? I had never heard of yeah. it. Yeah. And you know, and, and it was like, we're in Oklahoma, and, but it seemed like it was readily available there. And it's so funny. And that was kind of like my first connection uh, with American whiskey was was drinking it, you know, in Oklahoma. And and what was so funny to me is like now, I guess what now is considered top shelf, right? <laughs> or almost like even hard to define, <laughs> and like highly allocated. But like this guy, like that's all we drank. And you know, I've always enjoyed spirits. I think. What a lot of people don't know is that sommeliers, most sommeliers are in charge. It's our job to know anything across the spectrum of of of, of beverage. Hmm. So that's non-alcoholic beverage. Uh, I ran the bar program, right, at Per Se. You know, so our ideas like knowing spirits, knowing cocktails, um, that is part of our repertoire as a sommelier. It's not just wine. And so, you know, we kind of always dabbled in that kind of thing and, um the whiskey opportunity came along just through a friend, actually someone who I had worked with that per se, you know, so Sean Joseph's um, of uh, Pinhook, one of the co-founders of Pinhook, we worked in a restaurant together hmm. and um, you know, and we had remained friends, you know, he opened, I think one of the first uh, American whiskey forward restaurants called char number no. four. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we used to be there all the time, you know, and I kind of watched that rise of him opening these restaurants and then really getting into whiskey and then taking the leap and saying, hey, you know, we should start a whiskey company and, you know, thus creating Pinhook. Um, and so over the last 10 years, it's been in really interesting to see that brand grow, yeah. you know, as I'm out doing market work, you know, all across the United States, you know, walking into stores and bars you know, seeing, seeing it there, you know? And so we've always been friends and we're like, just, we're like shooting the shit. And he's like, Hey, you know, we're doing a collaboration series. Uh, you know, we've always had this winemakers approach, you know, cause Sean was a sommelier, uh, to whiskey. And, uh, he said, Hey man, like if you're up for it, like, you know, you seem like the perfect candidate. And I was like, Oh yeah. Well, what the hell? Like it's early 2021. I think we, New York city had just shut back down because of COVID. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure. And he's like, I've, 10 barrels of 10 year old Wyoming whiskey. And he came by the office and, you know, we blended for about six or seven hours and shot the shit. It was pretty fun. And I think in the end, you know, really coming up with something that, you know, we both felt comfortable with. Um, and then fast forward, we released those bottles and, and then I, I think all I got was like a whole bunch of nasty emails from people I had never met before. <laughs> right. <laughs> because they were, they were like, hold on. They're like, I didn't like to go those. I didn't know that I had to buy your wine in order for us to get a bottle of whiskey. He goes, I don't even know who you are. I don't even know like what your wine is, but if I would have known, I would have bought. It was like all these angry people. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Sean, like, uh, Hey man, I like, you know, I don't understand what's happening. Like all these people are mad at me. Like, I don't even know these people. And he says, Oh no, no. He goes, it's okay. 
I go, what do you mean it's okay? He's like, no, no, everything's going according to plan. I go, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, because in this business, he goes, you're not doing it right if somebody's not mad at you. So <laughs> he's like, this is this is kind of how it, how it works. And um, and and you know, it was it was fun. It was fun to like to to blend and to kind of do that thing and like to see it out in the wild and like really great. And and the fact that people were enjoying it, um, I think the gray market got out of hand a little bit. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think out of hand, but, sure. um, you know, I think now bottles are somewhere around six, $700, uh, if you can find them. Right. But, uh, you know, Sean and I were talking and we were just like, Hey man, wouldn't it just be cool? Like to do it again, let's run it back. Yeah. But like this time, let's, let's do it. Let's do it different. You know what I mean? Like, let's run it back and like, let's do something that's more readily available, yep. like kind of more my style. And I've always been a fan of rye. And, you know, Rye was an America, America's first spirit, mm-hmm. you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of the underdog. And I think what, if most people understood that they probably should be drinking Rye young anyway, instead of bourbon, right? Yeah. Like in that, mm-hmm. in that sense of like being more accessible, you know, I just like, I always tell people is like most Cabernet drinkers are probably should be Syrah drinkers, right? Because it's exactly what they want and you can, they can't sell Syrah right now. So what you're getting in Syrah is, is an amazing value of, of what you would get for Cabernet. Mm. But rye is something that spoke to me and, you know, me and Sean were canoodling and, you know, and trying to figure out like, oh, if we had to explain, you know, the, you know, how it's like wine, you know, like Cabernet, bourbon is like Cabernet. It's made from corn, it's sweet. So it's rich, it's round, yep. and it's ripe. So think like more like Napa Cabernet. Um, and then rye has like, you know, has that spice, but like it has complexity to it. It's a little bit leaner, right? Um, it changes and evolves in the glass very much like Pinot Noir. Hmm. Um and and so for me, that was something that I wanted to gravitate to. And that was it. I think we hit the ground running with the idea and just and just like, hey, like this would just be really fun. And and in the end, you know, it's like, wow, like every time I taste it, I end up drinking a whole bottle, not by myself. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But it's, you know, it's something that's really easy drinking. Um, that I think, you know, that's a little bit different if you look at the mash bill compared to most rides out there, which I think are you know, 90, 10. Um, yeah. I think here what's different is, you know, it's, you know, 60, 20, 20, uh, and that last 20 being barley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's really, really what makes it bright. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I, that's what I really enjoy. It like, feels like a more of a refreshing thing to me um, than like something like big and vanilla, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing and, and sandalwood. So yeah, um, yeah we've been, uh, and I think it really, you know, people drink it, you know, take a couple of sips and, you know, their eyes don't really light up, but they're like, oh, this is great. And then when they see the price, their eyes light up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, 100%. And I, I just have to say, Andre, I have been preaching the gospel of rye <laughs> since nearly <laughs> damn near day one on this podcast. It's true. It's true. And true. literally, my friend the other day said he was over drinking a little bit, and I gave mm-hmm. him your rye and sons. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and he goes, Damn it, Brad! Are you turning me into a rive guy? And I was like, "That's right, I am." <laughs> yeah, no, man. Every now and then, every now and then, we have whiskeys on this show that you know I like to refer to as almost like gateway drugs. This is a gateway rye, and I say that in okay. in that you know I'm a guy who leans more towards bourbon than rye. Brad likes rye a little bit more than bourbon. You know, if mm-hmm. it all is going to wash out, and the the notes on this are reminiscent enough of bourbon that I think if you're trying to dip your toe into rye, it's perfect for you. But then it also brings that, like you're talking about, that big, bold complexity. There's tons of pepper on this. Like it has everything you want in a rye, but it also is <laughs> it's just like it has these big open arms. That's like bourbon drinkers. You will find rest and solace here. Like it, it's just it's a wonderful gateway rye. Yeah, I hope so. Like I think, you know, I was trying to explain the other day. It's like, for new whiskey drinkers, I feel like it's a big bear hug. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. come on in. You know, this is something a little bit different. But, like, that gets you started. Like, you might stay here at this station, but you might get on the train and go all the way to Bourbonville. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, for, and for, like, the seasoned vets behind the bar or seasoned drinkers, like, you know, you got, like, your secret dap and handshake. Right? Everybody's <laughs> like, yo, like, you know what I mean? Like, this is, like, this is great. I feel you on this. Right? Yeah. Like, like, you know, and that's that to me like feels great. Like I feel like that it like straddles the line. And I think, you know, when we thought about packaging and that kind of stuff to me, it just felt like 
you know, let's let's be more fun and, you know, black and white and something totally different than like the old kind of I, I, what do I call it? I call it like Manila, like all it like there, no one uses white. They use like old mm-hmm. paper, yeah. right? like, yeah. like, Manila, yeah. like Manila kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, we just wanted to do something that like felt uh, different and and taste. Right. Like I feel, and also I feel like to talk about packaging, like sometimes, you know, people say that it, that it really takes away from the art. Um, I don't, right? I think like there's generally something about packaging that I think that resonates with people. Did you design the artwork for this? I did not. Okay. Um, we worked we worked with an artist, uh, Chris, uh, that the people at Pinhook like uh, put me onto, and I thought it was really great. He did these extraordinary, very detailed uh, drawings with a pencil uh, that if you look up close, you're like, wow, that kind of looks like a black and white photograph. Mm. Uh, and so there's lots of details in the sprig of rye. Uh, and, you know, um, and then there's a cartoon hand there, you know, to me, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, I'm not thinking, you know, what's really serious about this is the rye, right? That's where you see the detail. Um, you know, the cartoon hand is to me is more about just, you know, having fun, you know, like yeah. holding on to my, trying to hold on to my youth. Right. <laughs> right? Well, and a, and a cartoon hand could be anybody, it, you know what I mean? Like it could Correct. be anybody reaching for this bottle of rye. Right. Well, originally, I think the thought was the thought was my kid, but I think we can't say it's child's hand. So, <laughs> so we call my seven-year-old right. reaching for the bottle of rye. <laughs> All right, Brad, I'm going to put you and me on the spot here a little bit. Uh, we've got this poured out in front of us. I do want to give some quick tasting notes on it because it is just okay. it's stellar. And, you know, we've got the man himself here to just judge us harshly as we do it. But, <laughs> you know, the great thing about this is when I first popped the cork, I immediately poured it into my Glen Cairn here. The first note that I took on it on the nose was just bright. It reminded me and, and bright's usually a word that we reserve for like Irish whiskey. It, mm-hmm. It's some, it's what we normally get when we talk about getting melon on the nose. And I got quite a bit of like cantaloupe, a little bit of pineapple on the nose with this. Took a, took my first sip. That was all there. It was a real pleasant sweetness, real caramely on, on the palate into some of that black pepper. I sat it down for about 10 minutes, Brad, and I came back to it. And the nose had really transformed for me away from some of that melon into a lot of those more classic American bourbon-y notes. There was a lot of brown sugar. There was a lot of caramel on this. I love that this was kind of a shapeshifter in the glass. Yeah. For for me on the nose, I felt like it was almost like like a buttery frosting on top of like an almond cake Hmm. that just – it was a little bit nutty with all sorts of rich, you know, creamy butter – and then, yeah, there there was some hints of orange. I got a little bit of like a peppermint on the nose that like this this nose was so rich and layered. And I had not looked at the price point the first time I, I you know, drank this. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is like this is some really great whiskey just right off the bat with the nose. Yeah. And then I find that the more I come back to it, like I hate to keep saying classic American notes because that doesn't really explain anything. But I'm getting green apple on it now. Like it just it continues to have this perfect balance of tart and sweet on the nose um, and it evolves on the palate as well. Brad, like we we drink a lot of whiskeys on this podcast. Obviously, there are some that definitely punch above their weight class, so to speak, when mm-hmm. they're priced yep. at a certain price point. When I yeah. saw that this is twenty eight dollars a bottle, like I crapped my pants. I'm not going to lie. This yeah. is I I. <laughs> If you had asked me just point blank, what do you think this is priced at? I would say like, well, you know, considering who is blending it and the packaging is great and like the names that are attached to it, this is probably between 50 and $60 a bottle. At $28, Brad, like I said before, this is a 10 out of 10 value. Yeah. I mean, at at like $38, $40, this is a, a solid value in the rye world. Bob, I, I, how much does this cost again? Can you uh, say it one Yeah, more that time? would be at 28 <laughs> American dollars, Brad. 28 USD. Andre, yeah. hats, off, hats <laughs> off, man. <laughs> no, it's great. You know, I'm over here smiling from ear to ear. But, uh, you know, it, that, that, that's exactly how we wanted to hit. Like, it's like that, those are the first impressions uh, that we had. And it definitely translates to other people. Mm-hmm. Um and and that I think that's kind of the point. It's like to make the best whiskey we can do each year. We're not we're not distillers, right? So we, we don't distill. You know, we like to think of uh, of the barrels that we bring in as our harvest, right? Yeah. So this is vintage dated. This is 2022, uh, and it basically you know extends from you know from Pinhook's 
uh, winemaker's approach to wine. Um, I mean, winemaker's approach to whiskey. And so that's kind of each, each year. We're not chasing a style. We're just trying to make the, you know, and that, and I think in some of that ways, it's like, it's like this, this, I wouldn't call it homogenous, but it's this style that like, that, that wall turkey, I like wall turkey. You know what I mean? Just like every year it's exactly the same. Yep. Uh, and I understand that, but I think here is a little different where, you know, we want to just make the best whiskey that we could possibly make each year. Man, Andre, I feel like we could spend another hour, two, three hours just <laughs> talking about whiskey and, and wine and all of these things. But we are not just the whiskey podcast. We're, you know, the film and whiskey podcast. And I am just so excited to talk about your favorite movie today. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us what you chose for us to talk about? Yes, uh, Kingpin. Uh, one of my favorite movies with Woody Harrelson and Randy Quaid. It's a bowling movie. I'm a huge fan of bowling. I think most people don't know that about me. Uh, right. And like, you know, I played, I played sports, other sports, you know, I played basketball at a pretty high level. Um, but most, if most people ask me if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, it'd probably be knocking down some pens. That's it. First of all, so we're we're about to record a review of the Big Lebowski in like a week here. So mm -hmm. this is okay. this is very on brand for us right now. <laughs> but also, okay. like you know, your your assistant sent us over the name of your favorite movie and it said Kingpin, and I was like, you know, he's a really down to earth guy. So maybe it's the Woody Harrelson movie. But then I was like, man, I'm gonna feel like an idiot if I think it's this bowling movie. And then he's like, no, this is a very serious like cartel drama or like. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad to hear that it is Kingpin directed by the Farrelly brothers, yes. uh, you know, the, who helmed Dumb and Dumber and there's something about Mary and weirdly Green Book a couple years ago. Uh, <laughs> weirdly, yeah, yes. very, very out of character, you know, but <laughs> yeah. what what is it about Kingpin that keeps you coming back to it as your favorite movie? It's the classic, man. Like, um. I love bowling. I mean, there's so many one-liners in that in that movie. And and, and and to be honest, on the serious tip, like I like I never like the first time I ever heard of someone being Amish and what that meant was in that movie. Yeah, because Randy Quaid paid you know paid, paid the uh, the Amish character there that was like you know the bowler. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just like it was a movie about bowling, and I think like you didn't there weren't that many. And I think most studios this came out maybe right around the same time that The Big Lebowski came out. But yeah, the humor, you know, it definitely has that dumb and dumb humor attached to it, but it's just a really funny movie. And, uh, and you know, I'm not sure that it's aged all that well as far as, <laughs> as on the PC side. Uh, so, you know, you know, I might I find myself watching it alone most of the time <laughs> with no one else in the room. You're not going to um, host any tastings <laughs> where you guys go watch Kingpin afterwards. <laughs> we might. Yeah. We might. I, I might have to just, you know, bring a... Uh, bring HR along. Uh, but, you know, but also I feel like it, it, in that era, it was in the height of like movies having soundtracks. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, oh, so, like, yeah, they don't I don't think they do that anymore. At least like you, I, I don't even listen to them on Spotify. But, you know, like they would have the Kingpin soundtrack. And I remember like they had a lot of the a lot of the hits and like memorable music from that time. So Blues Traveler. Right. Yeah. was like on there. Right? right. So like, you know, that person was on there and like you know, I mean, it's like it's, it, it takes me back to 1996. But, you know, I spent a lot of time on, a, you know, growing up in the military uh, at a like bowling. You know, I think bowling was like 78 cents a game or something like mm -hmm. that. And so but the movie is just like classic, you know, Woody Harrelson, Big Earn McCracken. <laughs> you know, what I mean? just the cast, of, the cast, of the characters uh, are just, you know, they're legendary. I love it, man. Great pick. Yeah, I was gonna say. How, speaking of bowling, how many uh, perfect frames have you uh, uh, bowled? Three hundreds. <laughs> oh man, I'm actually pretty decent. You know, I was telling someone, uh, and the funny thing is, kind of like the drunker I get, you know, in that <laughs> setting, the better. Oh, the, yeah. the better. Yeah, I, that, I mean, I'm that yeah. way with pool. If yeah. I don't have a drink in me, I am garbage. But anywhere from two to five drinks in, <laughs> I, mean, I can hold yeah. my own. Yeah, I'm putting it on them. You know what I mean? Right. Like, really, like, really, like, uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think maybe, maybe five or six perfect games. Wow, something like that. Maybe Wait, or something like that. You've bowled five or six per Andre. I don't yeah. know if you know this, 
It's huh. really, really hard to bowl <laughs> yeah. a perfect game. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Got, I know. I went bowling a few weeks ago and I cracked a hundred. Yeah. So that's my uh, okay. that's my achievement. Oh, that's that's my standard. Yeah. Uh, I I can usually do it, but hitting triple digits is my standard <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I think I think last time I, I was probably maybe twenty nine. Okay. When when I when I bowled a perfect game, but like you know, I mean, it's so funny because like is this something you did? Like you were in a bowling league, you bowled, and like that was it. But like. You know, you know how like when a movie comes out and it's the, a sport that you're into or something like that, like you kind of gravitate to it. And and I think you know, I, and for me, it was one of um, you know Bill uh, Bill Murray's one of one of my favorite character characters of his. Yeah. By far. Oh yeah. All right. Before we let you go, Andre, we've been implementing this thing on the podcast when we have interview guests, and it's based on the TV show Inside the Actors Studio with James Lipton. I don't know if you're familiar. It used to air on yes. Bravo. And at the end of every one of those episodes, James Lipton would sit down with the movie star and he would go through a questionnaire that they developed that we have kind of shamelessly stolen and adapted for our purposes here. Mm -hmm. We're calling it Inside the Whiskey Studio. So we've got about 10, 12 questions for you. Kind of rapid fire. Are you ready for Inside the Whiskey Studio? Yes, I am ready for the Inside of the <laughs> Whiskey Studio. All right. It's a little tongue twister. I know. We're going to kick you off here with this one. <laughs> what is your favorite word and what is your least favorite word? Horse <laughs> it seems to be my favorite word right about, the, right, right about now. The, the third uh, question was, what is your favorite <laughs> curse word? Oh, so, there's uh, a, I got one. I have one for that one, oh, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. cool. <laughs> so favorite word now is probably being horse <laughs> Least favorite word is... Uh, I haven't been trained for that, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. All right. Well, what's your favorite curse word? Favorite curse word uh, is probably f off. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now, now is that one word? Yeah. It's, I, I, I kind of string it all along. <laughs> okay. And it's like, I would say like, f off. Right. <laughs> that sounds like a very <laughs> New York type of thing. Yeah. So. yeah I love absolutely. it. Sounds like you've assimilated well there. Yeah. <laughs> I've been told that. As a New Yorker, I imagine this next one's going to be near and dear to your heart. Uh, what sound or noise do you love? What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, sound and noise that I that I love is um, is like the birds outside our window, mm. like just like bo birds in the morning. Yeah, like and you can definitely you can still hear that in New York. That's something that that like it almost feels that that I'm not in New York. Yeah, and then what comes along is probably my least favorite thing is um is the sirens mm -hmm. you know yeah uh, and actually it's probably not even the sirens it's the horn so we live right around the corner from a fire station and they kind of roll down on our block so the sirens you can kind of like it's all it feels like i'm not annoyed by that it's the honking of the horn mm -hmm. because yeah. it seems it seems pointless yeah dude right the I, siren, yeah that's right i lived in uh philly for a year and oh i am with you there <laughs> yeah all right. What yeah. profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Bowling. <laughs> we should have done that. Answer, Bob. Yeah, yeah. He's already Bowling. perfected it. I mean, yeah, it's an easy transition at this point. Well, we'll see. We'll see if I still got. It. I still rolled. I think around Christmas. I think I rolled like uh, like just low two hundreds. When you think about movies, books that you've read, who are your favorite fictional heroes? Oh wow. I, you know, I have to say, um, uh, just most recently, Walter White from Breaking from Breaking Bad, man. Like, <laughs> like I, I think you might have missed the that. point of the show, Andre. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, I, um, yeah, he was, you know, he's, you know, like you take things into your own hand, like you know what yeah. I mean. Like, I felt, I felt like he sure did. You know, he he. He was the hero in that. I think his wife. <laughs> I think his wife was considered the villain. Actually, I just pictured Andre watching like the pilot, like episode one, and being like, "This guy, he's. I don't need to watch anymore. He's a hero." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's like, uh, well, you you can see where he turned, like where he was a good person. Absolutely. You know, when he when he when he like when he watched Oh Boy's Girl choke on an overdose, yeah, man. and didn't do anything, he changed. Yep. Right. You know what yep. I mean? Like that's where he became. That's where he became hard but like it, he was always trying to do good and and like on the path but you know he was a hero in i think in a in the worst type of situation mm. you know yeah 
All right, next up, if you could have any person's singing voice, dead or alive, Ooh. whose voice would you choose? Wow. That, um, what's the guy? My favorite band is uh, this band called City in Color. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and he used to be part of a screamer band. <laughs> and, All right. uh, but like he doesn't scream in this. He has like uh, one of the one of the best voices I've ever heard. Like between him and um, uh, the weekend. Oh, nice! Uh, oh, but it's just amazing. It's called City and Color. Um, I gotta look him I up. I think his name is like is, is like Dallas. He's like he's a Canadian from Toronto. But like, uh, yeah, I'm like been fascinated with his music. Wow. And if I could ever, yeah, if I could ever have anybody singing voices that guys check it out you, shout out to I dallas dig, yeah all right i think you, yeah. i think you guys i think you guys would dig it the most the right the right answer to that question was freddie mercury but that's okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is a natural gifting that you don't have that you wish you possessed just to be handy like yeah. I'm, I'm like i'm not i, I can't i can't do I, you know I, I can't do anything i'm not mechanically inclined I can't build. Shit. I can't. I, you know, I'm like paying somebody seventy five dollars an hour to hang a picture frame. Like I'm just not. I'm just, I'm just not good at that, right? You know. Man, and, and like I, my brother in law, he like you know he built his whole house, right? Right. Yep, you know, so yep. you, you're like smoking a cigar with him, you know, out front of his house, and you're like, it's like you built this whole f- yeah. thing, and like I'm yep. paying somebody to hang, yeah, that's, hang a photo. That's when you're like, oh man, okay. Well, <laughs> let me know if you need a Bordeaux recommendation. I guess, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> For your housewarming party. Yeah. I remember a mentor of mine when I was a kid telling me he had just become a homeowner. And he was like, man, becoming a homeowner is just a a process of realizing that you can't take on the projects that you already started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. We got two more for you. All right. If you uh, forgive the dark turn here, but if you had a say in how you died. How would you like to go out? <laughs> oh man! All right, let me. I, I got. Let me first get a PG thought yeah. there. And then... I, I've always been. <laughs> I, I, my example is like I've always wanted to be the guy in the cartoon that just gets the piano dropped on him because it's like you know, like it's you're done. It's quick. Yeah, exactly. It's quick. It's easy. I would probably say in my sleep. I think the whole deathbed thing kind of. You know, with people crowded around you, that kind of like is weird to me. Like, mm-hmm. I go in my sleep, it's a, you know, a few, you know, a few like hiccups, like body jerks, and it's over. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. All right. Well, the most important question that we will ask. Well, you, Brad, Brad easily, give him a preface for how this came about. Well, a, a while back, um, I don't know if you, you know, the national brand sponsor for Ardbeg, uh, Cameron George. He's an incredible guy. But he was talking about pairing whiskeys with fast food items. And okay. I, I just think that that is the most fascinating idea. So <laughs> if you were to pair Ryan Sons with a fast food item or even with, you know, a fast food restaurant in general, what would you pair it with? Uh, Ryan Sons whiskey. Uh, I like to call it. What do we call it? We, we, it's affectionately known as uh, yoga mat. But it it is the McRib. Oh, nice! <laughs> Let's go, <laughs> McRib. You know, and if I'm feeling fancy, I might like you know shave a couple black truffles on it. But there you go. That, <laughs> but <laughs> but Ryan Sons uh, whiskey with uh, the McRib. I love it, Brad. This is how I know Andre is like our people. No hesitation. Yeah, like you could right. tell that he had already prepared that. <laughs> it's like right there, I, front I of mind. I think mine. he's eating a McRib right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually no longer available. <laughs> I know, I know, so, man. Uh, no, totally. Yeah, I did a whole. Uh, well, you know, having a fast food background, and then you know, we did a whole uh, episode of pairing wine with fast food, mm. and uh, and so it was something that was like you know near and dear to my heart and fun. Yeah, but. Uh, but yeah, when I think when I think about Rhinestone's whiskey, and if I had to pair it with anything, like hands down, McRib. Yeah, yeah. Andre, I cannot thank you enough for sitting down with us today. This has been just an absolute pleasure. I mean, you have an open invitation anytime you want to come report on your bowling progress. Anytime you <laughs> <laughs> any new vintage of Ryan Sons, we would love to sit down and talk with you again. Thank you for joining us. No, are you kidding me, man? Thank you, man. It was my pleasure. All right, everybody, this has been Andre Houston Mack. You probably already know him from YouTube and or one of the many restaurants that he's worked in. (laughs) 
his new line of, of rye, Ryan Sons, uh, this vintage 2022 is phenomenal. If you mm-hmm. find it on the shelf, $28, it'll be one of the best 28 bucks you've ever spent. Brad, I don't know if you agree, but uh, I am oh. I'm going to go through my bottle real quickly here. Yeah, I will be <laughs> sharing it with all of my friends. So, yeah, it, it's Thank an incredible you. whiskey. All right, everybody, we will be back on Monday with another regularly scheduled episode. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.